good day welcome all of you to yet another edition of uh, naturalist future 2.0 my name is dr raina raj head of marketing natural remedies private limited i would be the moderator for this webinar naturalist future 2.0 is a webinar series powered by natural remedies private limited where we invite eminent speakers across the globe to share their thoughts on the most relevant topics of the animal health industry in the month of june we had met up mr peter crystal who had given us immense insights on managing the modern broiler breeder we have with us today dr jeraman uh, dr jeraman is a well known eminent breeder specialist and he has his coverage in india and subcontinent he has 27 years of rich experience in broiler breeder operations in broiler integrations parent layer commercial layers and hatcheries a brief highlight of his profile he is graduated from madras veterinary college very long time back he is currently working as a freelance consultant for poultry in south asia and middle east he is very well experienced in troubleshooting capabilities in poultry farming operations as well as differential diagnosis of poultry diseases he has delivered many lectures on disease management and conducted many trainings on post mortem techniques and farm management he has authored and co-authored many articles in reputed national and international magazines and he has received best veterinarian service award from indian poultry journalists association in 2006 Welcome to you, sir. At Natural Remedies, our legacy of being pioneers in herbal animal healthcare products was further emboldened by our chairman, Mr. R. K. Agarwal, and his son, uh, our MD and CEO, Mr. Anurag Agarwal. Under the eminent leadership of our commercial director, Mr. K. Narendra Reddy, we have become India's number one herbal animal healthcare company. our portfolio includes specialty products for all farm animal species which are used in more than 30 countries worldwide we are proud of our best in class natural solutions backed with deeper level science developed at our world class research and development center at natural remedies we are guided by our vision we harness nature and apply science for health and happiness our very backbone is our r&d center with more than 40 scientists and various domain expertise more than 120 scientific publications in peer reviewed journals more than 15 patents more than 220 phyto compounds isolated for global reference standards more than 100 monographs contributed to united states pharmacopeia british pharmacopeia indian pharmacopeia etc our stringent quality control process is guided by four cardinal principles genuinity safety efficacy and consistency we are very proud to say that we are a local organization in india which has become a global brand now to make this webinar interactive there are options for chat questions and polls in your screen you will be seeing poll questions three times in this webinar in the middle of our webinars if you are using a laptop or a desktop you can see these options on the right side of your screen if you are using a mobile phone you can see these options if you scroll down please use the questions option to ask questions any time during the webinar and we would be happy to answer all of your questions during this webinar or through your email at a later time today dr jeraman would be enlightening us about the current breeder challenges need gap analysis and solutions over to you sir thank you doctor um dr raina uh, yeah. is my presentation uh, visible and I, am i audible yes sir it's visible and you are very clearly audible sir thank you doctor thanks for the introduction doctor and good morning everyone and it's a 
nice occasion to share uh, Monday morning some important insights into the breeder management and the need gap analysis, the challenges. And I will be talking on uh, uh, what is the current challenges currently happening around in the breeders, phase wise, understand how we can overcome them before overcome them what are all the causes which causes the particular conditions so i'm going to talk about on these lines a short introduction and uh, what are all the challenges in the brooding phases and the grower phases and in the laying stages what is the troubles we are going to have it in males like and female side and a brief uh, take home summary so this is uh, going to be a short uh, uh, agenda or the line of talk what I'm going to have it today. If you talk of the broiler breeder, it's not an easy task. With invent of uh, the advancements, what is happening in the breeding, we have challenges to cope with that level of challenges. If you understand the, the business, you understand uh, the how you can overcome it. So it's very healthy business starts with a healthy animal. So I like this caption very much. So it, it implies a lot. It implies a lot and uh, it is not an easy task. Earlier days, productivity of the broiler breeders was not that much so if, at, with the level of knowledge what we had in those times we could able to handle it but with the advent of more more number of cheeks more uh, performances in the commercial offsprings we are forced to have a better understanding of the issues of whatever it is facing so if you talk of uh, the uh, current challenges you have to understand uh, we have got uh, at least uh, two three uh, different kind of breeds are there different breed carp ross and others also there so you need to understand comprehensively what are all the challenges what you are facing it and uh, if you look at the phases of the diseases slightly even though they vary but still uh, the major component of the trouble are same for all the breeds so if you understand the issues you understand the uh, remedies to overcome it if you talk of uh, let us start with the chick phase in the brooding stage uh, you it chicks comes very nice at the day of uh, a reception and you will find everything looks so nice and cool uh, it will be running around and you will feel very happy but as days advances you will find trouble with one or another so you will able to see one such problem is lameness if you look at the issue uh, you will find uh, the incidences are slightly on the uh, higher side in the males. I would say the maximum times you will find trouble with lameness. This kind the picture, whatever you are showing, you will find very early ages itself. Sometimes uh, you do get, because of the transportation stress, few chicks get like that, but you have to understand it uh, if you are not going to progress further you can say okay it's a transportation stress too much of uh, uh, the transportation time it has taken probably they are uh, had some trouble with leg and you have to discard but is it going to stop there only no you would observe sometime they develop or progress over the period of time when it becomes an adult or age becoming more and more, you will find a very clearly 
more amount of uh, birds developing lameness. You would find uh, hot swelling. Sometimes it would be unilateral. Sometimes it will be bilateral. Majority of the times you will find unilateral. The reason is that when they have a problem, they will try to tend to have more balance with another leg where it is having, having a problem. So thus it injures itself by uh, the another leg wherein that's why you get unilateral or one leg getting more swollen than the others. It, it, this will, uh, you can see the birds when you handle the birds, when you touch the hawk, it will impulsively, it will withdraw its leg or it will show the pain. It's because of this reason only you say it's an uh, uh, hawk swelling, it happens. Sometimes uh, reddening of the hawk also you will find. Means what you can say is that uh, you, if that particular leg where it is swelling is there, redness also will be there. And uh, if you cut open that, condyle swelling will, will be there. Sometimes you will find mild swelling of the condyles also will be there. And uh, if you look at sometimes, you will find inflamed condyles also. Why this inflamed condyles happens? Sometimes it uh, is not able to get up, move properly, thereby it hurts is uh, condyles in the cages. If it is in cages or if it is in deep litter shirts, it uh, gets uh, rubbed into the floor and sometimes you will find even ossified condyles also. Ossified means it becomes solid, it cannot able to flux it further. So you find uh, these kind of uh, condyles as well. Okay. Sometimes because of that, you will see the postural differences also. You will be having bent hawks. The bird will try to bend his hawk and stand. If you look at this bird standing position of this leg, if you see, you find it's bent as if it's like a bowed legs. If you see the human being, you might observe the bowed legs. The similarly, the bowed legs will be there or bent hocks will be there in terms of uh, for the birds. Okay. If you look at it, here comes the clue. You will find sometimes swollen plantar surfaces. You will have a swelling. You will not see that only in the hocks you will find swelling in that the bottom of the leg or uh, this one you will find uh, swelling also in the legs will be there if you ask the reasons sir majority of the people will try to address saying that sir leg leg weakness is there i think some calcium phosphorus deficiency uh, probably we have to add it something uh, uh, corrected. Some people will try, oh, no, probably uh, D3 will help. Is it a deficiency? Is it a disease? Or is it a faulty brooding? These are all the questions will come to your mind. Some people will think, okay, no, this is lameness is because of uh, the trace minerals. They try all the combinations of uh, calcium phosphorus or D3, or trace minerals. So we have to understand what is that exactly the issue is. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we would go for the first poll uh, in this webinar. Uh, dear uh, uh, participants, if you can see the polls option towards the right side of the screen, you can see a poll question already there. Uh, I'll read out that poll question. Uh, at what age do we think the first debeaking of the male and female chicks should happen? The first debeaking, at what age it should be? Uh, there are multiple options given between 30th and 40th day, between 10th and 14th day, in the fourth week, or none of the above. If you have any difference of opinion, please register your votes. You can take 10 uh, seconds of your time and uh, register your poll there.
Um, sir, the initial response is uh, there is a vast majority, 67 percentage of our participants believe that it has to happen in between 10th and 14th day. Uh, there are now it has gone to 74 percent. So it is a vast majority who believes it is 10 to 14 days the best. Over to you, sir. Uh, that's the right answer and uh, probably uh, the breeding people know that uh, that's the one here there is a reason for that uh, particular thing uh, of putting this particular uh, big trimming photo so normally the first big trimming happens in the first to second week of age and uh, second big happens in the growing phase okay what it has to do with the particular problem I was talking and uh, the lameness issue. There is a reason behind why I have put this particular slide. See, uh, when the you look at the causative organisms, really, this is the one which is causing the problem. Sometimes uh, uh, people miss this. Uh, saying that uh, it is some other issues, actually they forget and one important thing is a staphylococcal infection. Staphylococcal infection is a bacterial infection which causes the major trouble to these birds. All right. When you look at this one, there is a, a paper uh, published uh, uh, as early as 2017. They found staphylococcal is a potential pathogen in the broiler breeders. They found earlier this was implicated in BCOs, that means bacterial chondronecrosis and osteomyelitis in the broilers, but this is the step along with RES, Staphylococcus agnitis also is a major pathogen in the poultry. To make it simple, I will tell this particular pathogen or the staphylococcus is the one which is uh, uh, a one which invades through your injury one of the injury is uh, the beak trimming what we call as a um, uh, dbt actually the right terminology is beak trimming the beak trimming actually causes a Okay, uh, I think we are experiencing a little bit of a internet connectivity issue from our speaker end. We'll, we'll just wait for a couple of minutes uh, by the time Jeremy Mansa comes back. In the meantime, I would request all of our uh, participants to please uh, ask your questions in the questions option. Yes, now Jeremy Sir is back. Sir, please proceed. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry for that uh, no problem, uh, hiccup. And uh, I would like to uh, again add the screen and uh, sure. just give me a minute, Doctor. Okay, is this screen visible now, Doctor? Uh, yes, sir. It is visible. Yes. Yeah. So, sorry for the hiccup. And uh, the Staphylococcus is the one uh, agent of which we miss uh, many a times. So when you look at the issues, as I mentioned earlier, uh, sorry, when you look at the, these things, it invades through the injury. When you are going to beak trim the birds, it invades into that one. Probably you might ask another question. Sir, when that is the case, why uh, we have slightly higher amount of injuries or why, why we found higher amounts of uh, the incidences noticed in the male breeders, not in the female. I would probably like to say you can, uh, males have got the longer shank length when compared to the females, the articulations is slightly more difficult for the male breeders. And the second thing is, when you have uh, the trimming of your comb in the male, that is also an another injury. These are all the probable reasons why you are getting uh, these issues uh, to the males. So when you look into that, that is the reason. 
in uh, some of the times the advice happens do not give the initially uh, the phases of uh, time you don't give antibiotic do the antibiotic therapy post B trimming so this is the reason for your explanations right what could be the the best choice of the treatments would be it could be the penicillins or the derivatives of penicillin amoxicillin is a better drug of choice it works well for this one it has got a very good spectrum for this agonism and it reaches the synovial joints normally some of the drugs commonly what we use don't reach the synovial joints they don't have that spectrum so either you could use a streptopenicillin or uh, benzodiazepine penicillin which is a long acting or you could use amoxicillin so when you do so you give the best uh, uh, treatment for these ones so my suggestion on this topic would be you could avoid first week antibiotic rather than you can use a probiotic and once the big trimming has happened you could uh, go with uh, antibiotic so that it covers so what should i do in the first week sir you can go with the probiotics or sort sort of things and uh, uh, you can postpone your antibiotic therapy to the second week it gives the very best results and similarly my suggestion is also antimicroplasmal therapy also you can combine in the second week so that gives the best coverage for your uh, uh, your this particular problem right coming to the second phase second issue challenge is uh, intersusception commonly uh, we call in uh, the common term a prolapse but technically if you ask uh, it is an intersusception intersusception is protruding of intestine one into another that is technically called intersusception prolapse is just a physical manifestation but uh, it, it is actually an intersusception, right? This is a very familiar phase. Once you shifted from chicks mash to growyer mash, you will find this kind of a thing, right? Is it a syndrome or it is because some somebody says, sir, it is genetic, sir. It, this particular breed has this problem. Somebody call it as a disease. What is that actually? Let us see a little bit one by one. But, if when you see this particular problem, you will find the problem in the growers. When you trying to reach around 10 weeks or 12 weeks of age, it will gradually disappear. All right. What are all the common causes? It could be picking or it could be low fiber, sometimes irritation in the intestine, excess pressure on the intestine, sometimes necrotic enteritis and the coccidiosis. These are all the things what we know in the books we say but there is something more than that as well as we look at that if you look at the bacteria which causes the problem sometimes if you find necrotic enteritis they subsequently will find mild uh, coccidiosis we know uh, maxima and but uh, if you observe sometimes you also find necatrix so this is the one from the protozoal point of view and from the bacterial point of view which predisposes okay to that in some of the times the breeder companies as well recognized it and uh, given in the manual itself around 28 days of age they are suggesting anti uh, coccidial drugs like amprolium give so and so doses in this period why is that because when the damage to the intestine happens your intersusception uh, is getting aggravated all right another thing which is the important one which i would like to discuss here is the feed restriction feed restriction is a common practice what breeder company people does recommend to control the body weight is it anything wrong no there is nothing wrong in that but when the Intersusception happens is when there is a competition between the feed, the heavier boards try to consume as much as board possible. So when it happens, so you find a reverse peristalsis of the intestine happens at the distal end so that it telescopes inside. 
normally you will find after post 7 to 10 days of age you will find the uh, uh, intersubception starts here understanding is very much required and the reason is that why is that feed can feed restrictions has an a role in it if you observe it the heavier body weight what they call it above average body weight birds has this problem more why it should not be there in the lower body weight birds reason is when the lower body weight birds are below standard birds you tend to give normally higher feed increment when you give higher feed increment compared to the standard birds you there you don't get a problem but for above body weight birds you tend to restrict the feed when you tend to restrict the feed you have a problem of uh, uh, the faster competitions and you will find intersubception or uh, so here i would like to say if your cumulative feed consumption for that particular feed of time is optimal or up to the breeding company's recommendations generally you don't have a problem what is the trick is that you have to measure or titrate your feed so that if competition is less and you have less problem with this one so this is an very very important thing you have to understand so i think you can say sir i am giving as per the spec of the breeding company's nutrition then why i am having the problem i am giving as, as per their uh, uh, specifications only but why i should have a problem in that case why uh, uh, i you am getting it but if you look at it uh, closely sir you will find in on uh, observation whenever your cumulative feed consumption for that particular period of time is lesser than the standards means you are under spec your nutrition or your uh, your formulations what happens with the less amount of feed itself the bird gains more when the less amount of feed itself the bird gains more weight means there will be more competition when there is more competition naturally the intersubception happens so you have to take care uh, i would uh, sir i give jump extra enzymes in there. i am taking only 45 even though i get 46% protein i take only 45% protein something like that if you are going to take it it ends up in excess body weight excess body weight you tend to reduce the feed when you tend to reduce the feed it creates more competition when more competition the birds tend to have more kind of intersubception right there are few solutions which are there to overcome this dark outhouses yes it gives a good help as i mentioned earlier monitor the feed consumption and give as much as the right amount of feed birds require sometime dilution i will not say dilution of the feed probably you you have not given the right specification as per the breeding company's recommendation usage of anticoxidials yes it is very much recommended because even i am repeating even in the caged birds uh, you are finding coccidiosis some places the cage houses is at the floor level some are having elevated platforms the percentage of affection slightly differs even then you have uh, issues with both the cases i have seen elevated cases as well is having this issue and uh, your uh, um, uh, the floor houses cages also you are having this issue second thing um, sometimes people do try to give antibiotic during this period some of the antibiotics actually uh, works in the principle of thinning the intestine thereby it reduces the inflammation but in this case i would say please uh, you have to understand the mechanism of uh, this one and intersubception intersubception when already the intestine is thin it leads into the intersubception when you are going to prefer this one, it sometimes don't help or may aggravate. Better go for a natural uh, uh, 
alternatives like plant extracts or probiotics that helps so this is the uh, suggestions i would give it for uh, probably your uh, interception okay now the time for the poll thank you so much sir uh, dear participants it's time for the second poll of the day uh, you can see a poll question on the right side of your screen uh, this is about male birds uh, we are going to open the topic on male birds so which parameter when it comes to the male birds is crucial in breeder farming is it higher male female ratio is it the quality of the male birds or do you think both are of equal importance or you are not sure of these two options if you have any other uh, options you can always put it in the chat we will uh, it can be made much more interactive uh, so please take 10 seconds of your time and please submit the vote and we will take up from there So the early response is that uh, the quality of male birds as well as the higher male-female ratio, uh, both are being given almost the same priority. Uh, over to you, sir. OK. Uh, if you look at that, uh, uh, the answer for this particular thing, you will get it in uh, layer stages uh, issues. I would. Uh, I'll go back and explain that again in that these things. In layer stage, we have got not only issues with the females and the males, males also have some issues. For example, higher depletion. We'll, we'll talk one by one on these things. Coming to the first male, normally if you look at uh, the producing cage systems, you will have uh, the space for one is to 10 or sometimes one is to nine in the laying houses means uh, we say this much percentage of male if it is there that is enough my point to everyone is just presence of male number alone does not means that you are you will get best fertility it is the male number as well as the quality of the male and the number proportion of the male is equally important because you may be having many males but if the males are not uh, sufficient enough are having good uh, uh, capacity to produce good quality semen you don't get uh, the good fertility people in the deep litter knows very well there may be male inside one is to ten ratio it will be there but if one male is injured because of the pick order, the others will not touch the females of that injured males. So what happens is that particular 10 female will be always uh, will not be unserved. This is in the deep litter. Coming to the cages, you will have a males. You will try to compensate uh, taking a semen uh, uh, from that male also. But if it is not giving enough of the uh, good quality semen, in, indirectly you are contributing to the infertility. So to have good number of males, what is critical? Number of males, live males, good males is very, very important, right? If you ask uh, people in India, I would uh, say the majority of the birds are in cages. I talk a condition on the artificial insemination. Normally, you tend to uh, touch the male once in three days. Uh, the two days they will give a gap, and the third day will try to take the male, touch the males again. This is the initial stages. It is fine. What happens when age advances? When you lose more number of males, the farm supervisor will try to take every give insertion to the downline people, collect it next, next. So they don't really see. So the, every alternative days, you will be checking it, uh, touching the male for milking the cell. What happens is when you are happen to do that, you naturally lose a lot of uh, uh, that uh, quality of the cement is compromised. 
if you are having sufficient males, sometimes you can rest the males. For example, 10 boxes you need. I, I have excess males. I don't touch these males. I mark that particular boxes with a rope or something like that. Give a rest for one week. Again, come and touch that. Take the males for milking of semen. You get wonderful quality uh, semen there. But are we in a position to do? You may not be able to do it unless you preserve the males or the males are alive. A good company, good uh, management means if your female mortality is 8%, your male mortality can be around 10% during the laying cycle. But if you look at the management and practices, sometimes we have seen the male mortality is almost double that of female. So what happens in later stages, you are left with this uh, crux of trying to collect male semen again and again. So male management is very critical. If you look at the semen uh, requirement, it's around uh, 200 million uh, per insemination, sperms per insemination. But if you look at it, uh, uh, one male, it will serve approximately at 10 females. Say, for example, 2,000, uh, 2,500 million sperms per ml, per 0.7 ml of this thing means you will get it approximately 150 to 200 million. But are we in a position to get that? That's the big question mark. That is the reason uh, we are looking at is male critically. Right. If you take this particular photograph taken by, it's uh, three males contributed to 2.1 ml, approximately 0.7 ml per male. But in the later ages, you will not be able to get this one. That's the crux. And another thing, there is a very, very interesting article which I found. This was something around 50, 1976 approximately 30, 50 years back, they have observed the major cause of the male depletion, major cause of the male depletion, 33.8% is because of tenocyanamitis or these things caused by staphylococcus. I'm repeating, not only in the growers and chicks, the same is the problem in that adult as well. So male management is very critical. For this, I would uh, say, uh, do not uh, try it. The common practice is try to do with oxytetracycline again and again. I would prefer you rotate it with penicillin, amoxicillin. Sometimes you could also do with tylosins so that it helps in the this one. And in the later stages, as age advances, you don't have big options uh, to con preserve it because naturally the semen quality and quantity goes down. I would say male fertility enhancers uh, like uh, uh, to give that higher quality of semen is advisable because you cannot beat the nature beyond a level. So this is in, with respect to the, the males. Coming to the females. Females, we have got a bucket list of uh, these things. One is non-layers what we call as a non-layers. There are several reasons why your ends may stop laying eggs. If you look at it, uh, first you have to identify the non-layers. See, how we separate non-layers is when the time of insemination, people will find, uh, sir, the event is not averting. They will inter indirectly tell, sir, it is not uh, going, giving a production. And uh, everything, I think it, it's going into non this thing more. But I would say you can identify a little earlier as well. For example, watch for the comb and vatel. I'm sorry, uh, shank and uh, beaks. It will be yellow in color. You, if you see the right, there are two boards are there. If you look at the comb maturity, they are okay at this point of time. But the board here, which is there, in which I'm pointing out through my cursor, has got a yellow beak. So likewise, if you have yellow shanks and endo beak, if you take it, the vent will be dry, pin bolts will be closing together, then 
before a version stops, you can identify this non layer and bring it to this one. Okay, now I just told how to bring that one. I will see what are all the causes. This is a big, big subject. It's uh, managemental. You have got bacterial and viral diseases, and you have got a trouble with the parasitic issues and nutrition. This is one of the biggest uh, things which is bothering the producers currently. Managemental, if we will, will not take that seriously, but actually it has got a big role. For example, if you have a higher body weight boards and the lower body weight boards in a higher proportion, if the uniformity is not good, what happens is after 65 to 70 percent of the feed, you tend to give the same feed for all the boards. OK, not a problem. But when you are coming down from the peak, the birds which are of the higher body weights tend to get lesser allocations when you are withdrawing the feed. When you are trying to withdraw the feed at lesser levels, you have problem with uh, these issues. So think you will have issues of this will try to conserve the nutrients for the hen and it will not pass on. So actually then it goes into the non layer. Sometimes this is uh, uh, often been overlooked for the reasons of the non layer. Coming to the second thing is a bacterial and viral infections. Generally, when you find the bacterial infections, you will often notice uh, what you call uh, the feed is not consumed, feed consumption is low, and the bird, uh, you treat the bird, it becomes all right. But you sometimes the some of the bacteria goes into the ovi duct they causes damage there at that sometimes it does it become non-layer so it's not that uh, only uh, nutrition sometimes causes but actually uh, you have got the viral diseases as well create a problem next is nutritional nutritional it's a big subject uh, if you ask me what is that specific, which one is causing that major problem, it will be difficult to say. In general, what you have to do is that you have to optimally provide the nutritional thing so that you don't get trouble with that, one. especially trace minerals and all has been implicated in this formation of the non-layer. Coming to the another one, again, uh, uh, under underrated the issue is that lice and mites. Lice is the one everyone knows very much, but please be aware in recent times I'm finding the red mites. The red mite is the one which normally comes to the bird to in the night hours. So if you try to look at the red mites in the morning hours, you will not find it. Once you get to uh, when the light is switched off in the night hours, if you if you put a light and see that, you will find red mites. Red mites is not only cause anemia and this thing, they got a lot of non-layers. So you have to be careful on this uh, aspect as well. And uh, controlling the uh, parasites is not only just spraying medicine, it is also the applications. If you don't apply the right PSI and uh, or you, you will say, sir, I'm spraying the medicine. See, if uh, the recommended is 120 to 130 PSI or 8 to 9 bar is the right pressure with which you have to spray the medicine. Second thing, before setting up, switching off the light, couple of hours before you have to do that. Otherwise, you will try to control rate of might, wherein you will be spraying in the morning, but the effect will fade off. But again, the night mites will come and jump. So the time of application is very critical in controlling the mites as well. Herbal preparations also available in mite control. So I would say um, it's uh, advisable and better if you try to go with the uh, uh, herbal preparations. Worms is another thing very frequently asked. Sir, I am my birds are in cages. Is it uh, worms a major problem? Yes, even though I would not say a major problem, it is a problem. 
sometimes when you find dendritis in the intestine, you find quite a good amount of uh, tapeworms or roundworms are noticed. So deworming in the cages is also an important thing which you have to take. And if it is there, it also leads to non layers to some extent. Uh, sometimes when you ask, sir, my birds are having a problem, what should I do? This is the big question and million dollar question. Some people resort to partial mold. For example, you can reduce the feed to 100 grams or something, leave it for 10 days or 11, 12 days, then again start increasing the feed. It comes back. But always is it working? It's not working. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't help. You could try volatonics. Volatonics are the herbal preparations. When they are given at that time, it helps to rebound the boats. You are worried about only those which are visibly non layers. What about the boats which are coming to that? In that particular scenario, these volatonics, when I see, for example, 40 45 weeks of age, if I start giving to the crop, I find better results in coming back. You can People are uh, trusted one uh, placentrix uh, injections that is helping, but for the non-layers which has been separately separated. But what about the one which is coming down from the peak? These kind of herbal preparations are this one. But very important thing is when the birds are having a problem and coming back, you have to be very careful. When the convalescent phase itself, you should use it or when there is a downfall of this production non-layer development that time itself we should use it then only the results are better this is an another important point which i would like to mention coming to the disease challenge during the peak production nowadays the boards are performing uh, boiler beaters are like just like a layers they lay eggs very nicely and the peak is very good Suppose if you're having these kind of issues, what you can do, you have to make the bird very nicely primed or protected for your basic uh, uh, challenges. Okay, this uh, time for another poll question. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it's time for another poll. Uh, now, please. Uh, look into the polls option. You can see one new poll question. It's a very uh, you know straightforward, simple question, which uh, it's very very important, and we are going to open up that chapter now. Is vaccination the only way for immunization? If your answer is yes, please state yes or no or not sure. You have ten seconds of your time. Is vaccination the only way for immunization? Uh, so the initial uh, response is very, very uh, uh, particular. Here it is, there is almost an equal divide between yes and no. Okay. That's an interesting uh, thing, Kosti. I would answer it a bit briefly here. Yes, when you talk the immunity, people say, sir, I have given vaccination. I think I have immunized. There is a difference between vaccination and immunization. What is vaccination? And sir, I think it's both are same. No, it's not same. You think that I have done vaccine. I, I hope that it, it is immunized. Sometimes it depends upon various factors. If you don't space out the vaccine properly, you don't get proper immunization. If the boats are immune compromised, they are not immunized, even though you are vaccinated the expected title will not come if the vaccines work well in healthy birds. So rather than going in for again and again vaccinations, I prefer to say, please take the help of helping gangs like immune boosters, like immune modulators, whatever whenever you are going to give that, that also backs up your bird so that your titus, even though it is not a good phase, it helps you to overcome and bring that gap of lacunae, what your vaccination has not achieved. 
So there are uh, well proven uh, uh, methodologies are there. A lot of uh, uh, studies have been published on that. So I would like to say that please you have to consider vaccinations alone will not give you have to give the right environment right spacing and right immune mode status both should be there so if you would like to these ones you may have to use the uh, vitamin e selenium glucomannans herbal products a lot of that is giving getting attention recent times in uh, immune boosting properties so you could uh, take these measures to bring back the production or the immunization process very properly. Nutrigenomics is a big subject which is going to play a major role through the nutrition, how we are going to enhance the upregulating genes of the bird and downregulating the undesired ones to get an immunity. For example, heat shot proteins and all, we have found very good uh, neurogenomic properties influenced by the uh, minerals and vitamins. So likewise, uh, you can try this one uh, for boosting the immunity. Okay. Now coming to the next challenge is the fatty liver. Sir, uh, if you ask the breeder producers, sir, do you, are you having fatty liver syndrome? They will say, yes, I am having a problem. When you are having a problem, sir, post peak, I'm having a problem. Okay, you have a problem, right? All right. But if you look at uh, what's the reason behind it, if you look at the mismatch between the energy supplied to the board's requirement, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes you might have given the feed what is being required, but whether it is exactly requiring the production and the maintenance or it is getting supplied you will observe for example if the bird has to gain 20 grams or 30 grams the bird will be gaining 60 grams every week in that situation the excess amount of gain actually caused by the excess amount of the fat deposits and the body free so we have to be very careful in trying to understand how much the bird required and how much you should supplement if you are, sometimes people find it very reluctant to reduce the feed when the birds are coming down from the peak. When they do so, they inverter, inadvertently allow the birds to gain more body weight. So it's very, very critical. You have to be very careful on feed allocations and the feed withdrawal. So if you would like to bring it back, you could try choline chloride is a very good one synthetic and natural equally performing well you could try one liver tonics does the same role and uh, you have to be very careful uh, uh, this one because if it is too much beyond a level it is very difficult to remove it so if, if you are at mild to moderate it was extremely good and coming to the another one uh, this production is a very important thing uh, which everybody is facing now. Sir, I had a problem with viral challenge. I had a problem with bacterial issues. The, it's not coming back to the normal. Sir, what should I do? This is a major question people ask again and again. So what they does is when they are coming, to, I'm, so, I'm sorry, uh, when, when it is not that one. When you have to look at it, when the if it is not coming back to the normal, please remember you might have given some antibiotic, you might have some intervention programs. When the birds are recovering, you will tend to say, "Sir, I will wait. There are toxicity. The birds are recovering. It will come back to the normal." Sometimes, if the standard is seventy-five percent, it will stuck with sixty-five or sixty-eight. It will not come. So after that one month, they will think, what should I do, sir? By the time the inflammation is so much, scars will be more in the OB duct. The production ovary and OB duct functions would not be that great. In that situations, even simple oxidative stress is even which causes that uh, hormones to and down, go down. You will not get the same production. So whenever you are recovering from that, 
I am repeating. Whenever you are recurring from the problem, you cannot take a call. I will wait till the end of that. I will see whether it is coming back or not. If I try many a times, answer is it's not great. 50-50. So I would say if you are going to bring it back very faster, even these things at the convalescent phase or the recovery phase, these products really help very nicely. Coming to the respiratory disease complex, respiratory disease complex is quite common and it is in very lot of the places it is being reported. It could be anything. Normally we think it's a coryza, mycoplasma is also indicated. ORT is ornithobacterium. Another one, it is getting reported a lot. And avian metanemovirus. It is a viral and many other places Earlier, we were again and again looking only this coryza mycoplasma to some extent ORT, but recent times, avian metanemovirus is equally in, uh, is getting reported more and more. So you need to do a thorough investigation before coming to a conclusion. What is your exact problem? Of course, the coryza incidences are very high after many years in India. I'm seeing that but these are also on the rise. As I mentioned earlier, don't, uh, if uh, uh, you have to understand the issues and try to uh, do them. Sometimes people use uh, ir, uh, so much of this uh, product on triple salts like the Virkanas. It is a good thing, it controls, but again, if you are overdoing it, I've seen in many places, they found liver damage and ruptures. When we stopped these chemicals, we found the bird itself has recovered on its own. If you would like to control respiratory infection and all, please use herbal products are there. A lot of uh, herbal with essential oils are there. They are safe and it is giving you very good results. So you have to be understand that very importantly. And uh, enteritis is the one which is a very, very common it is caused by many reasons. Non-specifically, if people think if it is an enteritis, immediately they jump into some sort of an antibiotic and trying to control. You could find sometimes toxin also causes, worms also causes, chemical toxins, and sometimes necrotic. And you have to understand, when your egg selections are bad, if your intestinal health is bad, you will not get the best performance. So you have to be very careful with enteritis. So you have to remove the root cause and run it. Don't just go in for, if it's an enteritis, I'm going to give these medicines, it's not going to help you. Sometimes if you're not quite sure, antidiarials are there. Herbal antidiarial preparations are there and chemical antidiarial preparations are there. You could go for it, they are safer. Understanding the root cause is important. Coming to that, it is a combined strategy, health and nutrition comprising biosecurity is going to help you. And the take home message for me from my side on this particular topic is there are challenges. You have to understand the basics of it. Just spending money on assumptions, actually uh, it, uh, it is okay for some extent, but many a times it doesn't give you the best these things. So understand the root cause, understand how this happens, take the help of diagnostics and go, go for it. You give the better performances and your profitability. Thank you. With this, I end my formal presentation. Over to you, Dr. Raina, for the q &A. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. It was very in depth. Uh, mostly oriented around the health of the the breeder birds so i i am i'm getting quite a lot of number of questions uh, in fact in our previous webinar also we had a lot of health questions rather than the nutrition related questions so uh, my sincere request to all our participants uh, you can post any questions pertaining to the health or nutrition anything related to the breeder uh, we will be very happy to answer right now or at the end of the webinar in through your email that's so, did my presentation stop? Or yes, it is, yes stopped. It, it is stopped. Sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the first question that we have received yeah. on this yeah. aspect is uh, from one of the most 
uh, well known uh, uh, doctor in our in in Karnataka, uh, so when to restrict feed? Uh, that is, at what part of age restriction? You know, uh, yeah. a, the restriction has to be practiced, and what not to be practiced. Uh, restriction uh, does uh, uh, male and female is slightly different. One week difference will be there as per the breeding companies. You kindly follow that restriction. For example, uh, some three weeks to four weeks of age is the right time you start doing restrictions. The age of the restriction, you should stick on to the producer's recommendations and please go for it. But here my point is, you will you, the, the specs will change. If you take four to five weeks of average grams, for example, two grams, three grams, five grams, you check that grams and see for that five weeks cumulatively, what is the gain should be? And what is the feed given? For the feed given of, don't take one week, take five weeks. That five weeks of age you have taken, for example, five to 10 weeks, how much you have to give, for that how much gain you should give. If you are having more, then there is a scope for understanding your nutritional and you have to modify it. Restriction has to start as per the recommendation. I would not say we should do later, no. Okay, sir. Uh, so the next query is on the worms, you know, that you had mentioned about the various different kind of worm infestations. Yeah. Uh, what would be the best possible solution for tapeworms? Um, tapeworms uh, are quite, uh, 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 we are able to find it in recent times, uh, especially uh, when you are finding ants, the presence is there, you are finding it one. Broad spectrum. Uh, itself is working well, for example, liver mesol and down. If you are going to have a, a, a round worms, you can go for a, a specific narrow spectrum like paprasine for uh, either benzimidazole components like albendazole or you can go for liver mesol. But choose the right dosage because many a times I have observed one thing, people mistake the immunomodulatory doses as an uh, deworming doses they underdose it if they do so they don't get again after two days you are getting this one efficacy of the product depends upon the right dosages benzimidazole i will uh, for example the albendazole i would prefer um, rather than levomisole okay uh, so there is a question related to the uh, the egg breakages in the the later ages the breakage certainly increases it goes up to you know two percentage or more uh, as per the uh, the expert here how to control that particular aspect of old age okay see egg break ages in the older age groups to some extent is uh, physiological you cannot completely avoid it you can reduce the impact through the nutritional manipulations for example if you look at the nutrient specifications uh, you would find a slightly higher amount of calcium instead of 3.1 3.2 percent calcium and available phosphorus instead of 0.4 you would be 0.39 or 0.38 if you are going to give that you tend to give a better uh, right proportion for the setting that's the first thing second thing is that when you are going to use your calcium sources give 70 percentage of that uh 30 percentage is readily available and uh, slowly available for example you give it in if it is in grit 70 percent and 30 percent you can give calcite powder so that is the second thing you can do it. third one is that the major one what i would say in the older age groups the egg size tend to increase beyond the level of what the recommendations of the breeder companies. Two grams, uh, two and a half grams is the higher. That is the major challenge. Two reasons, body frame increases beyond the size because of the excess body weight. And when their linoleic acid levels exceeds, for example, 1.225, and you get that, in that case, a combined effect of controlling the body weight 
controlling the linoleic acid levels and the methionine levels gives the lesser right eggshell and you get the better eggshell quality and additionally you could give a slightly higher doses of trace mineral will help in this period. Okay, sir. Uh, so there is a, a question related to the feather losses. Okay. Uh, what could be the reasons for the feather loss and for prolapse? There is another question by the same person. Uh, in mid lay age of female parents, what could be the reasons for the prolapse as well as the feather losses? Okay. If I take the feather loss, sometimes uh, the sulfur containing amino acids are implicated. I would say improper nutrition also or some sort of stress if it is there, birds tend to lose feather, especially the post peak. As I mentioned earlier, it was if it is not able to give the best these things, it will try to reserve it by doing so they will lose the feathers. And that means the bird, if they are going to lose the feather and you will find sometimes the bird is going to be a non-layer as well. So then again, it will come back to the production. That is the first indication if it is a feather loss. If it is in any abnormal feather losses in the, all the birds, you could consider the protein required is inadequate. That is the second major thing as far as the product, this uh, feather loss is concerned. Second point of the question is a prolapse in the layers. Prolapse in the layers is two things. One is intestinal prolapse. Another one is oviduct prolapse. Sometimes if intestine gets prolapsed, it will tend to put a kind of enteric substances into the oviduct so that your oviduct gets inflamed, cloacitis, and ascending infection happens. You have to differentiate whether it's intestinal prolapse or if it is an intestinal prolapse, try to control the, the enteric situations. That is the first thing. Second thing, if it is an ovarian prolapse, means it is an ascending infection sometimes this is called vent gleed vent gleed is a condition wherein the ovaries will get little bit uh, i'm sorry uh, oviduct is the terminal portion of oviduct is get exposed and you will find infections sometimes if your cage mat is not that good if it is sticking when the birds are sitting it will pick up the ascending infection from the mat floor mat and gets into that, ends into the oviduct, this one. Probably uh, you can uh, give some uh, antibiotic uh, uh, solutions on the top of it, oxytetracycline LA or neem oil, and inject the same tetracycline long acting, just like doing insemination into the oviduct, it becomes normal within one week. Okay, sir. Uh, so there is a question related to vaccines, since you have good expertise in vaccines with your prior experience in HESTA and in your general practice as well. Uh, what minimum gap we should give between two killed vaccines? Okay. Um, see, ideally, uh, uh, four to five weeks is the minimum, a minimum. Sometimes uh, it is uh, required depending upon the the level where you require the titer, you have to space it out. Sometimes uh, you give uh, eight weeks to 10 weeks also. Uh, so it does not mean that there will be no this thing because when your vaccination schedule is intended for protection of that bird and also the later stages, you will find very long gap as well. For example, if you are doing first week IVH vaccination, Sometimes you get the vaccination at 20th or 22nd week. It's so big gap. But if you look at uh, the uh, Coriza vaccine, they face eight to 10 weeks of age. So likewise, it depends upon the bacterial vaccine or viral vaccine and intended usage, whether it's for the commercial, whether it's for the parent, that decision has to be taken. There is no hard and fast rule, but minimum four to five weeks is the gap. Okay, sir. Uh, so there is one question related to the toxins in feed. Uh, mm. Is there any possibility that there could be any change in the internal and external qualities of eggs due to toxins? Feed yeah. toxins, basically. Yes, yes. 
Um, if it is in mycotoxins, uh, it is well recorded. It is well recorded. There is a change in uh, internal and external. If I come to the external, if it is in a toxin times, you will find the loss of the pink bun will be there. Sometimes you find uh, thin shelled eggs also you will get. This is the trouble with the external shell quality. Internal external quality, you will find uh, uh, a trouble. Sometimes the blood uh, spots will be there. It's not only happen with vitamin A deficiency. It also happens during the toxin. Sometimes the permeability got lost and you will find uh, the blood drops. Especially T2 amandal is very well documented that it passes through that. You will find change in the internal quality as well. There is a change will be there. Okay, uh, so there is a very interesting uh, comment, and uh, the, the 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 requester is asking yeah. for your comment, expert comment on it. Yeah, uh, it's about the bird flu vaccine, the avian flu vaccine. Okay. It is given in other countries like Bangladesh, Indonesia, etc., mm -hmm. but it is not legalized in India. What is your comment on that, uh, Doctor? Uh, I mean, when I ask uh, the experiences of other countries. It is working and it is helping, uh, especially when it is the availability of the live and inactivated, it gives the best protection. For example, uh, H5, we are having the options with the response and uh, HVT plus uh, H5 in the day one and followed with inactivated vaccines. In Bangladesh, we find that we have only H9, only inactivated. As far as H9 is concerned, they don't prevent the infection. When the infection comes, it takes it, but still if the titer is good, it is getting protected. But in case of H5, the combined strategy of live and killed prevents the infection because it is a cell-mediated immune, it's very important there. It gives very good, but in the Indian conditions, my personal opinion, it would be better if it is available because of the experience of what I have from Bangladesh and other countries, I see uh, it is giving better results, good results. Okay, sir. Uh, so there is a question on the male birds. Uh, is the use of testosterone injection in males, uh, will it help you know, in improving semen quality and quantity? Is, is, it, is it generally a good practice? Should it be followed? Uh, is it a progesterone, Dr. You have asked? Testosterone. Testosterone. Sir. Testosterone. In males. Um, um, sorry, I haven't had a good idea about testosterone injections in the males. Um, probably I will think on that in the future and I could come come back sometime. As of now, I don't have an, a real time sure. answer for it. So. Surely, sir. Surely. Um, so there is one question on the double yolk eggs. Yeah. During early production, double yolk eggs are quite, you know, significantly high. Yeah. Sometimes it goes up to six percentage as per the yeah. uh, the, the, the yeah. person. Is there any way to control this double egg yolks? Yeah. Um, the double yolk eggs is basically a mismanagement between the timing uh, of the first ovulation and the second of these things. When you are challenging more amount of feed in an interest to gain that I should reach the, the faster peak, we find that this, what is commonly called as a jumbo X and W X. Second thing is, this not only leads to jumbo X, uh, you will have higher amount of peritonitis and also yolk ret retained that this, uh, this egg retention will be there and mortality will be also there. So the very critical part of the light stimulation and people tend to say that I have got the body weight, but if the birds don't mature properly, if you stimulate the light or if you stimulate or stimulate the light, you tend to get these jumbo eggs are very high, especially the uh, in, in this, this is kind of a mismatch of between the real requirement of the bird and what is being supplied. So challenging the birds with higher amounts of increments of the feed, 
uh, will lead to this kind of a thing. You have to be calculate the intent light simulation as well as feed for this one. Okay, sir. Uh, so earlier there was a question on the mycotoxins. Uh, is there any relation with white legs in broilers, the white legs in broilers and mycotoxins? If no reason, I mean, is there, is there any other other potential reasons for white leg in broilers? White legs, some of the breeds, uh, broiler breeds, I have seen the white legs. Second thing, white legs is another common thing which happens when your feed is devoid of maize. In recent times, I have seen people are using uh, feed even without not even a single percentage of maize as well. They are using more of a bajra and they are okay with the performances, but the color of the leg uh, goes down. Uh, these are all the two conditions where I found a uh, very, very clear correlation for the white eggs. Aflatoxins, I'm not quite sure. But I'm not. I, I don't know the answer of the aflatoxin. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, the, due to paucity of time, we would just take last two questions, and after that, we would share all those uh, remaining questions with you, sir. Only we will try to answer them and give it back to the uh, attendees. Yeah. Uh, sir, earlier we had a question on tapeworms. Yeah. In case of broilers, if these tapeworms are there, uh, would you suggest the same treatment, or or would you have any other tre different treatment protocols? Um, Doctor, the broiler tapeworm infestations, uh, if you are very high. Um, Treating the broilers would, would not be a very ideal one. Sometimes customer means the farmers, they go in for a catechu or these uh, betel nuts. That's the one thing what they regularly, uh, one kilo of a catechu for 1,000 birds or something, they will put it in water, soak it overnight, and take that uh, water and uh, grind that, and then they give it. That's OK with that. But uh, what I would say is that when they found very higher amount of these things, they have to look for the ant uh, populations. Normally, uh, these are very, very, um, these things are transmitted through ants. So control of ants would give the best result for the next flock. Hmm. Yes, sir. That's a very, very sensible way of controlling it, sir. One last question, sir, and this is pertaining to brooding. Hmm. Uh, there are two aspects uh, the, the, the attendee has been asking. One is the light should be stopped at what age during brooding? That is one thing, sir. And second thing is on um, antibiotics. When we have to introduce antibiotics after the brooding, at what stage we can start introducing antibiotics? OK. See, especially uh, the lighting programs, the first two weeks is uh, very critical that you may have to give 23 or uh, 22 hours of lighting. Later then, you can gradually come down and keep the intensity as low as possible. Many other places, uh, uh, they give excess lighting more than what it is required. It's just like a baby. You cannot keep the, since I'm having lights, I'm putting lights, so you enjoy it. No, they, they also require sleep. So it is as per the manual, you should go for it. At least first two weeks, uh, you can have that full lighting, then you can tap it up that to the natural writing. That is the first thing. Uh, second part of the question, doctor. Sorry, I forgot. The introduction of antibiotics. Sir. OK, introduction of the antibiotics. Introduction of the antibiotic, I would prefer uh, you can uh, start the day of uh, the big trimming or the, I would say, the, even the next day of big trimming would be still very ideal so that the already the it is there in the, in the bloodstream. Uh, so that it, 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 it is in the bloodstream. So when it is in the bloodstream, it, uh, you doesn't allow it even if you do big trimming. The first week, you could go with uh, probiotics. You, you cannot try to save the birds, half a percent of the birds. Those birds will anyhow will have a problem. It will die. It will not give the best performances. So after the big trimming, introduce it or at the day of big trimming, you can introduce it. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. You have taken a lot of questions and uh, the, the entire session has been very, very insightful. Uh, there are much, much more questions uh, coming in uh, through the chats as well as the questions options. So and uh, we have got a lot of questions even before, you know, uh, the webinar started around a list of 14, 15 questions. I have already noted it down, which 
Uh, I couldn't answer most of them, which we have received prior to the webinar. Uh, I would certainly share these questions with you, sir, on email. Sure. And uh, we would get back to the customers with the answers for that, sir. And uh, uh, thank you so much, sir, for, for your uh, time. Uh, and dear audience, it has been a very, very fruitful, interactive session. You had shared all of your, you know, the questions, your your chats, your well wishes. Please keep on uh, attending our uh, webinar platforms. Uh, very shortly, we would communicate to you the next uh, webinar under the banner Naturalist Future 2.0. Till the time we uh, meet again, uh, let's uh, bid adieu. And please take care of your health. Try to get vaccinated at the earliest. And please stay safe from COVID. Uh, let's try to prevent the third wave coming in. Thank you so much, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.